Hello students, it's Mrs. Moore uh, bringing you your Unit 6 Lecture 1 on the Constitution. All right, and so basically last time I gave you a very short video, which I'll call Part A, that talked about um, that talked about Ameri the American culture that was created and some American traditions and patriotism that came from July 4th. And um, this time, I, I got onto a path repeating too many things about the Article of Con Articles of Confederation, so I stopped the video, and I didn't know how to edit it properly, so I just thought I'd start over again with um, the Constitutional Convention. So there were flaws in the Articles of Confederation. It was fine for getting through the revolution, but then it became not adequate for peace, for peacetime. All right, so we have to begin with the, the convention. So after stalling for several months, Congress in 1787 called for a special convention of the states, oops, of the states in Philadelphia for the sole purpose that's better, for the sole purpose of revising the Articles of Confederation. There we go. By then, five states had already named delegates. Before the meeting, called to begin May 14, 1787, six more states had acted. New Hampshire delayed until June, its delegates arriving in July. Fearful of consolidated power, tiny Rhode Island kept aloof throughout. Critics labeled the fractious little state Rogue Island, so-called Rogue Island. A rogue is, you know, think of a guy who doesn't follow the rules and does things his own way, a ne'er-do-well. So Rhode Island was fearful of the kind of power that could come from the convention and exempted itself. Virginia's Patrick Henry, uh, who you'll remember him, give me liberty or give me death, he did not like the idea of centralized government. He refused to go and to represent his state. 29 delegates from nine states began work on May 25th. 55 men attended at one time or another. And after four months of deliberations in stifling summer heat, 39 signed the new federal constitution they had drafted. Only three of the delegates refused to sign. So, this is a document that is durable, meaning it lasts, and it's flexible, meaning it shifts. In some ways, they made a plan of government that anticipated things they wouldn't even know about yet. It was the men who made it, as a result, were remarkable. And last time I mentioned to you that these American principles were rooted in the Enlightenment, and there were great writers and thinkers who informed the way they thought. So it isn't just these particular men, it's all the great writers they read that came before them. The delegates were surprisingly young. 42 was the average age of man who was there. So not all white haired old men. 42, that's, that's about a little younger than, or a little older than I am. They were farmers, merchants, lawyers, bankers, many of them widely read in history, law, and political philosophy. Yet they were also practical men, men of experience, tested in the fires of revolution. So don't think soft professor types who think and think and don't know how to do anything real. Uh, no, men in full, men in full who could think and do. 21 had served in the military during the conflict. Seven had been state governors. Most had been members of the Continental Congress and eight had signed the Declaration of Independence. So they are in this for the long haul. The magisterial George Washington served as, presi as presiding officer, but participated little in the debates. 81-year-old Benjamin Franklin, who, who brought that age curve up, didn't he? Um, the oldest delegate also said little from the floor, but provided a wealth of experience, wit, and common sense behind the scenes. More active in the debates were James Madison, the ablest political philosopher in the book. So a political philosopher, this is something I studied a lot in college. That means someone who's read a lot of John Locke, uh, who studied the rise and fall of the, of the Roman Republic, who's read the Leviathan, 
who's read all these, these great enlightenment and pre-enlightenment thinkers who have thought about what makes a good government and what men are really like and what they need from a government. So that was James Madison. Um, let's see, Massachusetts Elbridge Gary, or Jerry, excuse me, a Harvard graduate who earned the nickname Old Grumbletonian because as John Adams once said, he opposed everything he did not propose. Well, we all know people like that who seem to argue for the sake of argument. George Mason, another man who spoke a lot. He was the author of the Virginia Declaration of Rights and a slaveholding planter with a deep-rooted suspicion of all government. Um, the witty, eloquent, arrogant New York aristocrat Governor Morris, who harbored a venomous contempt for the common people. Scottish-born James Wilson, Wilson of Philadelphia, one of the ablest lawyers in the new nation and the next in importance at the convention only to Washington and Madison, and Roger Sherman of Connecticut, that's my dog, a self-trained lawyer adept at negotiating compromises. And Adams, like Thomas Jefferson, was serving abroad on a diplomatic mission. Also conspicuously absent during most of the convention was Alexander Hamilton, who was a staunch nationalist. Um, he went home when the other two New York delegates walked out to protest what they saw as a loss of states' rights. So you will remember that I mentioned to you there are going to be a lot of things going on during a constitutional convention. First, how do we make a government that protects individual rights? And yet we talked about the balance of um, liberty and power. Okay, how are the people going to be free, but how is the government going to have enough power? How is the government not going to have too much power so the people can remain free? Then there is the balance of states' rights versus the building of a federal government. How are the states going to have power, but maybe not too much power, so to eclipse the national government? Because that was a problem in the Articles of Confederation. And the wonderful thing is, you could tell by the laundry list of these men and their qualifications, you have thinkers, you have men who are more aristocratic. You have men who are more plain spoken, um, lawyers, people who are known to be nationalists, people who are known to be more in favor of states' rights. When you get a group of people like that together and you can get them to agree on something, you know it's probably going to be something pretty good that is going to manage to satisfy everyone, or at least they thought of everything. So the central figure that's going to emerge is going to be James Addison, James Madison, excuse me. Um, he was one of only two delegates to attend every session. Small in stature, he was barely over five feet tall. He weighed only 130 pounds. He was frail in health. He was a 36 year old bookish bachelor descended from wealthy slave holding Virginia planters. Now I have heard a, an anecdote about Madison, but one of the men at the convention claimed he was no bigger than a bar of soap, so short. Um, he had a lot of headaches, he was painfully shy, crowds made him nervous, and apparently he had a high-pitched voice, which made him not want to speak much in public, um, much less debate. But he was a graduate of Princeton, he had an agile mind, and a very strong appetite for learning. And so he was eloquent and convincing in the arguments he made. And he was also continually willing to embrace compromise. And that's, that's something that if you want to go into politics or if you want to be a leader in some way, on one hand, you do have to have a clear vision. But on the other hand, you do have to know when to include people's opinions and their voices as well. And so he knew how to include others' voices. Let's see. Every person seems to acknowledge his greatness, wrote one delegate. Madison arrived in Philadelphia with trunks full of books and a head full of ideas. He had been preparing for the convention for months and probably knew more about historical forms of government than any other delegate. And here, guys, is where you see the wisdom of understanding history. How often are people challenged to build a government. And the way to know how to build, Samuel, will you tell the twins to be quiet? The way to know how to build a government is 
to study history, to see which governments have been successful, the ones which have not been successful. Because if you want to build a government like this, a republic, based on representatives with no king or czar leading it, uh, it has been mentioned that this kind of government history thought was pretty fragile, easily broken. So if you want to build something lasting, you have to figure out why those other governments were so fragile. And this is the sort of thing Madison would have studied and it would have made him an asset. Okay. All right. For the most part, the delegates' differences in political philosophy fell within a narrow range. For example, you're not going to have one guy stand up and say, let's just have a king. So what if we just fought this war? No, they're going to agree on those, those principles in the first section of the Declaration of Independence, those fundaments of rights coming from nature and nature's God, the reason governments exist to protect the rights of individuals, and then, of course, that people have a duty to alter or abolish that government when it does not fulfill its purpose. They're going to agree on those things. It's all about that balance of liberty and power, states and federal, all of this that they're dealing with. On certain fundaments, they agreed. Yeah, I basically just told you some of this, but they also agreed that society must be protected from the tyranny of the majority. And I don't know whether you've heard that concept before. We know what a tyrant is, someone who abuses rights, tries to take away the rights of others. But think of this, if the majority, majority rules, we often say, right? The people who vote the most the one way, they get to choose the president, choose what kind of ice cream we have at a birthday party, uh, choose the movie that a family watches in the evening. But we have to make sure that that exercise of power isn't tyrannical, that it doesn't step on the rights of, in that country, all those other people who didn't vote for that person, or we're not gonna force the lactose intolerant to eat the ice cream we choose, and we're not gonna make people all watch this scary movie if that's what the family chooses, and some of us hate scary movies. You see what I mean? I'm using kind of silly examples. But that's one thing that needs to be figured out. How do we protect the rights of everyone when a larger portion is going to win on certain issues? So that was a very important idea. The founders had to figure out, how do we put this into place in a government? Quite a task. The people at large must have a voice in government, but no one group should be able to abuse power. We need a stronger central government, but we all know that the powerful often abuse their power. These are the things that these men were arguing about. Most of the delegates assumed with Madison that even the best people are naturally selfish. So there's a quote maybe you've heard before that if men were angels, there would be no need for government. And that's the one thing that we all have to admit. We need government because of the fact that people don't do the right thing all the time. You may want to call it original sin, uh, that we are made in such a way that we're not going to do the right thing all the time. You want to just say people are no darn good, whatever you want to say. But it is that quality that means we need government. We can't simply trust people not to take what isn't theirs or not to do the wrong thing, can we? No. So this is something they all agree on. And we all agree too, the people, the, the delegates agree that people are naturally selfish. That means when I go to the hair convention, I'm going to argue on behalf of blondes and I will not care about brunettes or redheads or whomever else is out there. No, 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 I'm gonna stand up for the blondes, right? So people are selfish. They want what's good for them. I'm going to care more about issues maybe that are for women than men as a woman. Um, you understand what I'm saying. That all needs to be taken into account when you're making a government to try to make safeguards against someone being selfish and having power. Government cannot be founded altogether upon a trust in the citizenry's goodwill and virtue. Government thus needs checks and balances, okay? So you want to make sure that if this branch of the government has too much power, somehow this branch can check it and they will thus balance each other out. So we're not all ruled by the judicial branch or the legislative branch or the executive branch, okay? 
So the founding fathers, they thus worked to try to set up balances and checks with those three branches of government. Okay, so let's see. Hmm, the first idea for that was brought out during the Constitutional Convention was something James Madison came up with. His proposals came to be called the Virginia Plan. And his idea was that instead of revising the Articles of Confederation, let's just go completely back to the drawing board because a lot of the um, delegates came to the Constitutional Convention with the idea that we have the Articles, let's just tweak them, let's fix them, great. And Madison is saying, no, I think we need to start over completely, okay? So he submitted, he wanted to instead submit an entirely new document to the states because the states have to vote on whatever they come up with, all right? He proposed a separate legislative, executive, and judicial branch and a truly national government to make laws that bound individual citizens and states. The new Congress would be divided into two house, is, house is, a lower house chosen by the citizenry and an upper house of senators elected by state legislatures. Now, for those of you know who know this about the way the government is structured, senators, yes, they used to be elected by state legislatures and not the people themselves. So that changed uh, in more recent history with an, an amendment to the Constitution. Why, you might ask? Well, the people have a greater voice, a more small d democratic voice, the more they can directly elect um, their representatives. And if their representatives are electing their representatives, that didn't feel as small d democratic, okay? So it's trying to balance up the Republican forces in the government with the Democratic. Democratic, the people speaking, Republican, representative speaking. That has to be balanced as well, okay? So let's see. Um, some were critical of Madison's idea. One such alternative was called the New Jersey Plan, which wanted to keep the existing way things were in the Articles of Confederation. The idea was, let's just have all the states equally represented. And now here's the problem with this. If all the states have an equal voice, what about the states that have more people in them? Shouldn't they have more of a voice? But then think about little states with small populations. It makes them nervous to think that a big state would have way more of a voice. You see, that had to be balanced. So there, this New Jersey plan idea was all states are equally represented. And also that there would be a unicameral Congress, so one house Congress and that Congress would have the power to levy taxes and regulate commerce and the authority to name an executive and a Supreme Court. That is a powerful Congress, friends. So here are the two major issues the Congress is faced with as a result of the Virginia Plan and the New Jersey Plan. One, do we amend the Articles of Confederation or draft a new document? And two, do we determine who serves in Congress based on state or based on altogether population of America? So there are two issues here, okay? And I think that since I've already given you 10 minutes, I wanna stop there. I wanted to make this video just about 20 because I made the last one 10. You're gonna watch them both together to answer the sheet. <sighs> well, I hope you all have a lovely week and I will talk to you soon. Until then, Toodaloo. All right. Okay, you guys can be as loud as you want. Yay! Love you. You're my stinky pinkies. You're my jingle jangles from Village of Jingles. <laughs>